I took a stroll downtown this evening When I heard music echo through the night So I started running so I wouldn't be too late Welcome everyone to Coaching in a Session. My name is Mike Reardon and I'll be your mindset coach today. Today we're going to be talking about communication and the art form of it. Many people are afraid to public speak. Many people are afraid to get up on stage and present themselves. We are so worried about what we say or what other people think about what we say that we allow our voice to not be heard. Well, I have good news for you today. Today we're bringing on Brendan Kumar Sami and he's going to be helping us with our communication skills and so how we can get out and have our voice be heard with the tips and tricks and the must know things about communication. A little bit about Brendan though. Brendan is the founder of Master Talk. He coaches ambitious executives and entrepreneurs to become the top 1% communicators in their industry. He also has a popular YouTube channel called Master Talk with the goal of providing free access to communication tools for everyone in the world. And of course, his links are gonna be in the bio and of course the interviews coming up and let me tell you something about brendan first of all he has a voice of an angel but second he has a heart of a saint great guy and what he has to say in this interview is so profound and there's so much wisdom and there's so much we can learn just from this interview so let's get into it Welcome, Brendan Kumar Asami to Coaching Session. How are you doing today? Very good, brother. How are you, Mike? Doing well. Thank you so much for asking, and thank you so much for coming on. I want to talk to you about public speaking. I know you're a public speaking coach, and the fear of public speaking, the communication problems our society is having, there's going to be so much that we can learn from a person like you. Uh, can we just have a brief background of who you are and how you got into public speaking? Yeah, absolutely, brother. So I'm the founder of Master Talk. Master Talk is a YouTube channel I started to help the world master the art of communication, public speaking. And I also coach executives and entrepreneurs to be top 1% communicators in the industry. But how I got started wasn't as clean as I just talked about. I was in university and I went to business school with Michael. And I used to do these things called chase competitions. Think of it like professional sports, but for nerds. So mm -hmm. all the guys my age were playing uh, basketball, or rugby, or football, things as you can tell by looking at me, I'm not really well to do i did presentations competitively that's how i learned how to speak but then as i got older i realized that the people who are younger than me who were doing these competitions didn't have a coach and they also couldn't afford one so i just started helping them with their communication and then a few years went by i'd coached like 60 or 70 people and i realized that everything in my head wasn't available for free on the internet so i started making videos on communication on youtube and then the rest was history hmm. Yeah. And I find doing what you love, regardless if you get paid or not, you just want to do it. So you were just going out, helping people, coaching, similar to how I was in college. I was really into guitar. So I was the president of my music club and I would just give people free music lessons. They wanted to learn how to play guitar, come on over. And we would just get you free guitar lessons. But I loved it. Right. And it wasn't so much of, okay, I'm doing something that's going to make a living. It's so much more fulfilling for me to do this. What do you find fulfilling about coaching people, helping people become better public speakers, uh, whether they be just a regular Joe on the street or a top level executive? Yeah, absolutely. That's a beautiful question. I love, I love the guitar story. That's awesome. Yeah, I played guitar for five years and I stuck at it, but <laughs> glad, I'm glad you were able to teach other people your expertise. Yeah. So yeah, man, I'd say for me, communication is every component of our life. Mm -hmm. Is a lot of people forget that communication is so much more than giving a presentation at work, about giving a speech. It's every moment of our life. It's the way that we order food at a restaurant. It's the way that we talk to our significant others or our children or our nieces or our nephews. It's the way that we hang out with strangers when we travel or when we meet them at a park randomly. And when we start to embrace that side of communication, we realize that communication helps us lead a more fulfilling life. 
So I'd say for me, a lot of the problems in our society right now, the division that we have in the United States, cultural issues, put insert problem here, I feel a lot of it can just be solved with deep listening and communication. And if we can all learn that art, not only will benefit our bottom lines, but more importantly, the hearts, right? The way that we communicate with other people, the way that we accept people for being who they are once we have a clear understanding of why they do what they do. Mm -hmm. And I think it's more than just political aspects that divided people. Because if we look at the state of our society, especially here in America, people can't even have cordial conversations anymore, right? It's so much about my opinion, my belief. And if someone doesn't have the same viewpoints as I do, then we have a problem, right? So, so they don't, they can't even communicate how they feel. And then they can't even take the response of someone of what someone gives them back in return. So if I say something to you and you don't agree with it, I'm going to be able to listen to you and then to say, okay, I see where you're coming from. Versus if you say something to me and I haven't done any mindset work or anything, you say something to me after I said something to you, now we're having an argument. I don't like you anymore because you have a different viewpoint, right? Mm -hmm. How can people start to communicate differently or more cordially per se, where if someone has a different viewpoint, how can we have a conversation like that with someone? Mm, great, great, great perspective. I completely agree with everything you said. And now the basis becomes how do we communicate with people with different ideas? So mm. I would say the first thing that we can do is we need to first work on ourselves. We need to open our minds to those new perspectives. And one easy way to do this, which is simple but not easy, is think, make a list of all of your beliefs and listen to the opposite belief without interrupting the video without trying to cloud your mind. So if you're someone who's on the left, listen to someone on the right for 50 minutes. If you're someone on the right, listen to someone on the left. It actually doesn't matter which side of the aisle you're on. And what this does, it helps condition your mind and try, this is, this is the hard exercise, right? I, I give the right truth, but hopefully people apply it. I think that's the harder part, is try and argue the other side of your belief. Mm. Try and argue for the other side of your belief. And there's a great quote on this I'm going to butcher is that the beliefs that we never think to question are the ones that we should question first within ourselves. So when we start doing that, it really messes up our brain a little bit and helps us lead to the following conclusion. I'll kind of give the punchline away, mm -hmm. which is, wait a second, we all eat the same Big Macs. We yeah. all go to the same restaurants. We probably all hang out at the same park. Like there's not one park for a certain population than one park for another. Right. right. It's like we're all doing the same things. We're all watching the same superhero movies. So I'm pretty sure we can get along. Right. So I, I think that's really the, the takeaway from all of that and having those conversations. I would say that's the first piece is you don't even have to talk to people. Mm -hmm. You can start with going on YouTube, going on a, on like just watching people on the opposite side of the aisle and argue for them. Why are they right? And when we put ourselves in the shoes of other people, it really humbles us. That's the first tip I have on how to communicate different perspectives. The second one is communicate better and more effectively with people with the same perspective as you. So learn to ask better questions. So mm -hmm. don't just stop. So let's say we're both on the left as an example. It doesn't have to be the case. Mm -hmm. And let's say we're both having a discussion. Mostly just like, you agree, I agree, let's move on. Instead, let's have a more detail. Why do you believe that? What is it about the left that you agree with? What is it about the left that you disagree? Have a more detailed conversation with people who don't uh, trigger you emotionally in a bad way and improve the quality of the conversation with people you already like. Because mm -hmm. if you can't improve the quality and the depthness of the conversation with people that you already like, you definitely won't be able to do it with people you don't like or you don't mm -hmm. believe in or definitely. don't have the same belief systems. And then we transition to level three, which is, learn to do the exact same thing with people who slightly disagree with you and then increase the temperature over time. Mm, yeah, de definitely powerful steps there. I find, maybe you can agree or not, that our communication skills have downgraded over the years. And I think our smartphones has kind of dumbed us down where we don't have to be eloquent when we speak to people anymore because we can just send them a text. People get upset if you leave them a voicemail nowadays, just send me a text message. I'm not going to listen to my voicemail, right? That's where society is. We don't want to hear other people's voices. Just send me a text, what you need. Uh, send me a picture on Instagram, do a little dance on TikTok. It doesn't have to be any words, right? Yeah, get moving. But we have a problem with communication and it's because we're behind a screen. 
even how bullying kind of transformed. Now it was face to face. Now it's cyber. And most of that stuff is happening behind doors nowadays. It's not happening so much in person, not saying it's gone completely, but the majority of bullying now is happening online. Because if I can do it behind your back, that's easier for me because I don't have to feel any type of way. I don't have to defend myself. I can say my opinion. I can say my piece. And then you can feel however you want about it. Do you think technology is hurting communication and the ability for people to be effective speakers? Mm, Great question, man. So I would say I somewhat agree with you. So let's start with Mm -hmm. what I agree with. I definitely think there's a lot of parts of what you're saying that definitely makes sense because a lot of the pain sometimes gets amplified on social. Okay, like at least with bullying, when you're at home, you're safe. Mm -hmm. But when you're home, like, but now because of cyber, you can get bullied 24 seven. Absolutely, right? And there's a bunch of other things that could happen at scale that are not so fun. But I like to see social media like a tool that we learn how to use. So if it's like a screwdriver, if you use the right nail, if you use the wrong nail with the screwdriver, it's not going to work. You're not going to get the results you're looking for. So I equate that in the same way. So I don't think it's as dire of a situation that a lot of the media has this portrayed to be. I think it's more of a balanced discussion of how can we use social and video as a way to affect change, have more positive conversations. I'll, I'll tell you an interesting story. Out of the top 10 relationships in my network, 60% of them I met online, 50 to 60%. So I actually never met them in person. Some of them recently I just met in person. But if it wasn't for technology, if it wasn't for you know the new mediums of exchange, I never would have met those people in my lifetime because they mm. just live in completely different parts of the world, like Los Angeles. I'm based in Montreal, I live in Canada. And the other guy's based in like New Zealand and Albuquerque and all this stuff. So there's definitely a benefit to leveraging communication as a tool. But to your point, I would say the argument that needs to be made here is one word, which is education. How do we educate people to use the tools that we've been given to benefit our psychology, to benefit our mental health, to benefit our self-esteem versus not to. And then it, it comes down to once we empower people on the, the pros and the cons, then people can make a decision whether to opt out of the network or to stay in the network and leverage in the right way. And I definitely went for the second. Like if it wasn't for social media, I wouldn't be able to impact tens of thousands of people's lives or potentially more or even have this conversation with you. So I think it's the, the balance is the key. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and the reach that you can get online, right, from your social media websites, uh, YouTube videos, all of that is going to be more than if you just touch base with your local communities. And that was kind of why I left teaching, because if you know anything about me, I was a teacher before I was a coach, though I was making an impact in my school district, right? In my one school, if I went to other schools for some reason, yeah, I was in my school district, right? I was maybe dealing with 5,000 kids, but that's not 5,000 kids in different regions of the world, just 5,000 kids in my town. I wanted to have a bigger impact. So social media can make that happen more easily than just in person, right? Because yeah, we can travel the world and go to different areas and create small ripples in different parts of the world. That's helpful too. Having social media like YouTube, having meetings on Zoom, whether it be group or individual, that can be shared with people infinitely. So I can send an email to 100 people and they can send that email to 100 of their friends. And it's a chain effect more so than, oh, have you heard this speaker? Oh, he's great. You have to go uh, spend some time with him sometime. And then if he's in your town, if you're lucky enough, then go see him. The world's a big place. And it's going to be difficult for someone to travel all over the world, touch every region, without being burnt out or trying to get in accordance with people in their schedule, because everyone's going to have a different schedule. So being able to have a base of online, like social media is going to be helpful. And I know since the pandemic had happened and quarantines, it has become the given way of, all right, this is how we interact with people, right? It's just the norm almost per se now. Before we would go have meetings, I would do seminars and my whole coaching business, they had to do like a 360. Yeah, I did some online stuff, but I was going out. I was working with businesses and I was going in speaking with companies and helping them that way in my city. But when the the whole pandemic happened, it was a total shift. So I had to transition. How do I operate? Right. That's when 
their YouTube videos had started coming out and motivational videos started coming out more. So it happened after the pandemic, basically. So my communication has reached more people in the sense of, okay, I'm going to go on platforms that are able to help or be available to people all over the world. So it's helping me understand like, okay, I can reach more people, but at the same time, there can be a negative concept when it comes to communication online, because if I have a negative message per se, and I mean, that's going to be up to someone's perspective, but if I have a message that is going to harm people or be uh, hurtful in, in a sense, a, a culture or a type of person. Do you think that can be worked out with, you know, working with a public speaking coach saying, hey, instead of saying your message this way, can we make it more so it's politically correct? Mm, fascinating question. Also very correct. So I, I would say, Michael, I wouldn't worry too much about the coaching. Like for, for most people who want a communication coach, it's generally because their time becomes much more valuable than their money. So I'll give you an example. Let's say somebody's a manager in a company and they want to get promoted to an executive level or C-suite level executive. That specific scenario, it makes sense to invest the, the dollars into a coach because they're going to get the result a lot faster versus the, the, the gap of the money that they're paying. So they're just using money to speed up time. But I would say for the purposes of this discussion, I think it's more about being more open-minded and more mindful about the other side and asking more questions to the other side. Mm -hmm. So what do I mean by this? I mean, when we're having conversations in general to never assume something about what other people believe and to do the research, to be really open-minded about learning more about people, asking more questions. Let me give you an easy one, is questions versus statements. Most human beings, when we communicate, is most of what we communicate is statements. I believe this, and then the other person goes, I believe that, and I believe this, and I believe that. And it's always a back and forth ping pong of statements, whereas a very small percentage of human beings prioritize questions over statements. Mm -hmm. So the percentage of what comes out of their mouth is at least 40% questions, 30% questions. And the rest is statements, whereas for most humans, it's 90% statements, 10% questions. So I would encourage people to rethink that ratio. And for most people listening, just based on my experience coaching hundreds of people, definitely most people listening are in that 90-10 spectrum. Most of what they're saying are statements, they're not questions. So if it's 90-10, start making that 80-20. Start saying, okay, for every 10 statements, I probably might say one question. Okay, let's give ourselves a challenge. For every 10 statements, can we say two or three or even four questions within that same ratio? And that forces us to listen more to what the other person is saying and it helps widen our perspective leads us more to a point of understanding and allows us to react a lot less emotionally when someone disagrees with us in a conflict mm -hmm. all right i definitely love that and then it leads me to this question right some people listen to respond and some people listen to understand what's the difference between the two right because if i'm listening to respond yeah i'm just giving you your response like hey are you hungry no i'm not hungry or if I say, hey, are you hungry? And then I can say, okay, well, this person maybe didn't have breakfast. Let me ask them, right? So I'm trying to figure out, maybe they're asking me, am I hungry? Because they are hungry. They would like me to go get food with them versus me just being, you know, like aloof and just saying, okay, well, yeah, I'm not hungry. So figure it out yourself, right? This happens a lot with dating with guys. And the girl asks a guy the question, and the guy's like, yeah, I'm sure. It's like, she's trying to, you know, come on, guy. But so it, it, go, it goes a little bit into that too. Listening to understand or listening to respond, your take on that. Well, you just took me to like the seventh dimension. Of <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome, man. Yeah, I, I love that. I love your examples. I thought that was really powerful. Yeah, definitely. So the difference between listening to respond, listening to understand, is listening to respond to your point is really to get the job done, to really look good. So at the end to say, oh man, I want to make sure that when Michael's done talking and I respond, I need to make sure what I say is gold. It's mm, yeah. There's a certain amount of ego there too, at different various levels. And then the other piece is listening to understand, which is, am I actually helping Michael with my response? Mm. Should I ask more questions to make sure that I got what he's asking to make sure that 
I'm really getting to the core of what I can do to serve this person. Mm -hmm. So it's challenging, right? How do we go from a place of responding to a place of understanding? Not a super easy shift to make overnight. I would say the best strategy I've found, because I struggle with this for many years, I still do. No one's perfect. I mean, you're clearly a better listener than I am just based on how you you approach that. I never would have thought I was like, oh, hungry. Like, yeah, I'm hungry. And it's like, oh, what if the other person is hungry? That's like another playing field I need to get to. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think what I would say, just with my limited knowledge right now, is when it comes to, to listening, the best tip that worked for me, helped me, is to listen to a podcast conversation like this. Mm. And the reason it's so powerful, Michael, is because you can't respond. I call this listening to conversations that have already been, that have been over for a long time, mm -hmm. that have already concluded. So because you can't work a percentage of your brain to respond because there's nothing to respond to, all you have left to do is to sit there and listen to everything that's being had. And, and this, it could be this conversation or another conversation where you're just taking notes. I actually do that 10 hours a week. That's even to this day, I still do it 10 hours a week work. Yeah, sure, I'm, I'm guesting on shows, I'm communicating ideas, but I spend over every morning of my life pretty much, except when I'm on like retreats where I'm listening to other people's conversations that I'm not allowed to respond to, or I'm just sitting alone and I'm just taking notes and my phone's on airplane mode and I just listen to their conversation. I feel that's a lot more powerful because I'll draw the nuance a little bit. This is actually way more effective than having a live conversation. And the reason is because your, your brain is always gonna go to listening to respond because you, you're in the conversation, it's live, it's happening right now. So I would encourage you to practice in the gym in the back end by just listening to conversations that have already been concluded. And what you said is gold, gold for whoever one, anyone who's listening, that's gold because people try to be mindful and they have a hard time being mindful. How do I be mindful? How do I live in the moment? Do I have to do meditation? I can't meditate. Every time I meditate, I, you know, think about the stores and what's on sale and I have to go grocery shopping and the kids have to be picked up from soccer or, th or this or that, right? There's so much going on in our mind. But when we have a conversation like this, that you can stop, rewind, listen again, you can dig deep into that moment. And then you learn how to become more mindful when you listen to podcasts like this. Many people wonder like, okay, well, I want to be more mindful. I want to be more present and live in the moment. How do I do that? If you read a book, they're going to say meditation, right? But meditation doesn't have to be like what the monks do. It can be something that you do on the go. You can be walking in the park, listening to a podcast. That could be your form of meditation. Every morning, Monday through Friday, I'm going to the gym. That's my form of meditation. That is what I find joy in. And I take that time, whether I'm listening to music, podcasts, motivational videos, it doesn't matter what I'm listening to. Even if I don't have my headphones on, I'm still in that state of meditation. I'm focusing on each rep, every set, because when I can do that, then my mind is more primed and I do it first thing in the morning. So my whole day is set up for success. My mind is already in the pattern I want it to be for the day. And that's to pay attention. Many people don't like to pay attention. Many people are like, I do this and I do that. And it's so quick, right? People get bored so easily. Have you ever heard about a kid saying, mom, I'm bored, dad, I'm bored. They want mom and dad to what be their entertainers. No, it's that that child doesn't know how to use that moment and entertain themselves because they have been given everything quick fix. For example, kids yelling, screaming, everything parent doesn't have time, right? They have to cook dinner. They have to clean. Maybe here, take this iPad, watch a movie. So we're taking away the communication from parent to children saying, Hey, what's going on? Let's work this through. Now we're just giving them a movie. We're giving them something busy, right? Busy work. Think of teaching and giving kids packets. Packets don't help kids learn. Yeah. It might help reinforce things that they know, but it doesn't help them learn. They can read the directions, but even if you read the directions, if you can just recall being in school, reading the directions, you're like, what the heck do I have to do after reading these directions, right? Those directions are made for teachers, not for kids. So yeah, you give a kid a packet, maybe some are successful because that's going to be a different background because maybe they have parents at home who are walking them through those directions, how to understand what they read. 
many people, how we said, are going to respond to whatever they're given, right? That's what they have been conditioned to. I raise my hand. The teacher says, Michael, I respond. I'm not trying to understand anything because if you do try to understand something, this is a little bit about school, is that it's shied upon because not many teachers have the luxury of time in the classroom. Time is already so constricted. We have the curriculum that we have to follow. If we don't follow the curriculum, that's on the teacher. So we have to keep on moving where we can't have an open conversation every single moment. So a kid might have a profound thing to ask a teacher to understand more deeply any given concept, but the teacher doesn't have the time. So the kid subconsciously learns, well, I guess I should just answer to respond. It kind of hurdles into the adult life too. I'm just going to respond because what I have to say is not important. And many students get to that point. They say, what I have to say is not important. I'm just another student in this 30, right? Because the classroom of 30. So they don't learn how to be profound in what they say. So their voice is muffled. How can people start to find their voice, whether it be with them wanting to be public speaking or just being a student in the class saying, I have a voice, I have a purpose, I have something to say that's meaningful? Yeah, man, great, great explanations. I would say for the voice part, it's all about momentum and game. So what do I mean by that? The first piece is what is the one or two things that we can do to help build momentum over time? So mm -hmm. one simple exercise that I teach, and kids can do this too. We've seen people as young as five do this. It's called the random word exercise. So the random word exercise is simply, you pick a word like phone, like headset, like eyes, and you create presentations out of thin air. So when you do that, it increases your confidence because the first time you don't really know what you're doing. You're like a uh, phone is a, a socket and yeah. uh, teeth. And so you don't really do a great job at the beginning. But after you do this 10, 15 times, you see immediate progress in that exercise. And that's what kids really need at the end of the day. They need that moment and that boost of confidence because the education system doesn't give that them, does, doesn't give them that luxury because all of the presentation of the education system are mandatory you're forced to do something. You never really get to pick the topic. You got history class, you got math class, you got science class, you got presentations in gym class. Like who invented that? Like, doesn't make sense. Like, well, you got presentations in gym. And then the last piece is every presentation is tied to a punishment. That's super fun. If you don't do a great job in school, you don't get a pat on the back. You get a, you know, slap on the head. You lose uh, like 30% of your grade. So it's not a great environment for people to find their voice. So I would, I would encourage people to, or if you, they're educators, parents out there who are listening to this, to focus on simple, easy wins to help children build their confidence through the mm -hmm. random word exercise, as an example. That's one piece of the equation. The other piece is as they build up that momentum, it's all about understanding why they want to share their ideas with the world. Like think about your podcast. You felt a need to share this information in the way that you share it, in the way that you communicate your it through your medium to help people because you felt there was something missing in the marketplace and because of that desire whether you had a voice or not you chose to cultivate one you chose to refine one you chose to build upon what you already have which i'm sure was already a great foundation to impact more lives so that's the other pieces as we mature as human beings our our purpose our reason for being whether that's to be the best stay-at-home mother or to be the autopsy of a company is that purpose evolves and our reason to find our voice over time evolves as well. So it's all about starting with the right foundation, something easy for all of us. And then as we get older, letting that voice evolve for different reasons. Like when I started, it was mostly just to get through school. You know, I was growing up as a kid in a French high school and I didn't know how to speak French. So I had to present in languages I didn't know. So for me, it was just getting through the day. Mm -hmm. And then after the, my voice evolved to getting a job, you know, doing case competitions, getting really competitive, refining my voice so I could win these competitions. And that was my, my reason for speaking up. And then later on, it was leading those teams. And then to the point that where we are today, it's about leading others. Mm -hmm. right? so how do I use my voice to help other people gain access to free communication tools in the world? But it didn't, definitely didn't start that way. It wasn't as fancy as it is today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love the example that you said, just do like a one word type of presentation. I actually do that with my teenagers. So the youth that I get, 
I have them do that because they never have really done that before in their life. They might have, they had a teacher that knew about that, but they're doing it for the first time with me. And they're like, this is hard. And it's only one minute. And, and we're just literally talking one minute about this word. And I do it with them. So we take turns. And so they'll give me something that sometimes I might never know about. So uh, like a video game or something. And I would just have to make sure I know what I'm talking about. Like, okay, so it's a video game, right? And then they'll say, yeah, it's a video game. This is what the video game is. And then I'll just talk about it for a minute, right? I have no knowledge set on that video game, but I'm able to talk about it for a minute. And when I give them things that they know about, like their cell phone, they're like, um, a cell phone is used to make conversation and you can text people and you can watch TikToks. And that's how it basically is. They're just describing what the cell phone does rather than giving me a conversation about the cell phone, right? So it's just snippets. It's just statements of what this device is or does rather than having a conversation. So it's like the art of conversation where people can have a beautiful conversation. And after you're done with that conversation, you're like, that was, that was a really nice conversation versus you're like, what the heck did, you know, just happened, right? Because if people are just telling statement after statement, it's sort of like reading a PowerPoint, right? I can read the PowerPoint. I don't need people to read a PowerPoint. And that's why if you're doing public speaking, the PowerPoint's there to guide the speaker. It's not so much of, okay, guys, uh, here we have to talk about uh, inflation. Inflation is at 7.9%. The next bullet point, uh, the reason for inflation is that we're printing too much money. I mean, it is so dry, right? Because we're not being interactive. We're just uh, reading off a screen per se, and we're just trying to relay that information, but the information is already there. So conversation is so much more than just all right, I can read something and I can relay it to you, right? It's about understanding, right? It's about a deep knowledge set or knowledge base, right? Because what you do, you have a good understanding of public speaking, of understanding what public speaking is to the roots, right? If we look at public speaking, is it an easy thing or is it a challenge thing? Most people are going to say it's a thing that they have to work on in order to perfect. And not so much perfect, meaning it's perfect, but to make it to a point where they're saying, ah, I feel good about going in front of an audience of 10,000 people, where they're more confident. And confidence is always going to be doing the action before feeling confident, right? Confidence comes after the action. So I wanted to talk to you about the fear of public speaking. Why are people so afraid to speak in public? Why are people afraid to tell their deep inside emotions? rather than you just giving the blanket statements of something and playing it safe. For sure, man. You know, I've, I've thought about the fear of communication for a while now. And I didn't honestly know, I have a good answer a few years ago. So I'm glad you're asking me this question in 2022 versus 2019. Mm -hmm. So here, here's my common sense answer. Let's ask ourselves another question, which is where do we learn the habit of speaking? Where did we start presenting in the first place? And the answer is super simple for most of us who are listening to this pod, it's school. It's elementary school, it's high school, it's college. That's when we learn the habits of presentation. And then we bring that into every area of our life. But here's the problem, Michael. All of those presentations have three particular problems as a, like as a commonality. The first one is that every presentation is mandatory. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, hey, Michael, you only have breakfast and present all day? Nobody says that. And nobody does that. It's not something fun versus like, let's say, let's say we use, we put basketball in the equation. Yeah, some people love playing basketball just for the fun of it. Yeah, yeah, let's play basketball all day. Nobody says that about communication. That's problem number one. Problem number two is that every presentation, the students never really get to choose the topic. It's not like, what do you like, Michael? Do you like talk about mental health? I see like mountains, you like progress, you like dream. You want to give presentation on that? No, it's by the way, Michael, you got to talk about the Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And you're like, who's that? And then you have to talk about shakes when you're like, who are we shaking? What milkshake is this? Yeah. What's going on here? So we have to give presentations we don't even like and to an audience that really didn't listen to us. And we're doing like eight of these at the same time because there's like a presentation in history going on. Well, there's a presentation in math. So it's, you're not really trying to do well. You're trying to survive until the next day. And the third piece, which is the most important one, is that every presentation is tied to a punishment. Mm. So it's not, hey, by the way, if you don't do a great job, we're all still going to clap for you, everyways, and we're still going to give you 100%. No, that's not right. 
you know, Michael, I know you didn't do a great job with this presentation. I know you're 11 years old, but uh, we're going to deduct 50% of your grade. Okay. Okay. This is not fun. I'm not going to get played my video games. But anyways, the point is, when all of the presentations we give in our life are mandatory, they're different, and they're tied to a punishment, that trickles over into the boardroom, too, when we get into the working environment. All those presentations are different. All those presentations are stressful. So what's the bottom line? The bottom line is if we see communication like a chore, it'll become one. It's not that we're all scared of communication. I actually don't think that's the problem. I think the problem is we've been taught to perceive communication in the wrong way, mm -hmm. right? And, and what I've learned from coaching kids, I don't do a lot of it. It's most of my clients as kids. It's just to keep me sharp as a facilitator. I realized that when a kid is under like nine years old, they don't have a fear of communication. It doesn't exist yet, mm -mm. right? They're just kind of like, oh, you want me to do this random word thing? Okay. You want me to present this thing? What's the presentation? They're like, okay. And they just do it. And then the fear of communication gets taught later on in their life. And that's really the crux of the issues. Once we realize that the communication, the fear that comes with it is not our fault, but rather the fault of the system, we could unlearn it and focus on momentum, progress, and getting to where we want to be in life. Mm -hmm. How can we fight that system where the system is saying, all right, now we have to be afraid of public speaking. I understand that our words have power. And if we use the words incorrectly, we're going to be ridiculed are going to be ostracized. And I know many people are tiptoeing around what they say sometimes because they don't want to hurt someone's feelings. And it's kind of like a white lie telling a girl, you know, she asks, does the dress make me look fat? No, honey, you look beautiful. <laughs> of course, we don't want to have a public speaking conversation with her at the restaurant saying, you know, she's big and, and then now she's upset. We, we want to just make sure the conversation is cordial, that it's going to be polite, friendly. It's more than that, though. I, you know, I just made it fun. But when we go in front of big wigs, per se, right, we're so worried, will they like me? Will they accept me? Right? That peer acceptance is so powerful. Do you think that's more public speaking or just society as a whole? Mm, beautiful follow-ups, man. Let me think about that. I think what I would say is like, when it comes to communication, how do we get rid of that fear? And more importantly, how do we make sure that this, this is something that never happens altogether? I would say the way I've thought about it in my career and the way I approach it, feel free to follow up on what I'm saying as well, is like, is a question, right? And the question I always like to ask is how would your life change if you're an exceptional communicator? So the way that we unlearn this, the way that we unlearn this behavior is by focusing on the benefits. You know, many of us, we, we don't dream about our communication skills. We dream about our vacations, the new car we want to buy, the new house we want to rent, the mm -hmm. couch we want to buy. Like we don't focus too much on, wait a second, if my life was better, like if, if I was a better communicator, how would this impact my life? And once we focus on that question, that really helps us cultivate a deep understanding for what we want intrinsically for ourselves. Because to your point early in this conversation, everyone's different. Everyone has a reason for being. Not everyone is the top CEO in a company. Some people are stay-at-home moms. Other people are high school teachers. But when we start to reflect on that question for ourselves, we start to find the reason as to why we want to communicate in the first place. And we start to visualize and imagine ourselves. Oh, wait a second. If I could communicate better, my relationship with my family would be way better, whatever we're looking for. And that's what drives us to actually get excited about our communication skills. And the same way we're excited about different skills that we want to learn, like the first time you got into podcasting as an example. And once we change the frame of reference from the negativity, the stress, the anxiety, the, ugh, I, get, I don't want to do this, to what? Whoa, 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 wait a second. I get to do this. Mm -hmm. This is awesome. If I get better on communication, I could share my ideas with the world. I could get on a podcast. I could talk to a thousand people that I don't get to see, but I get to hear my voice. I get to start a YouTube channel and all that stuff. That's what creates the momentum. And then last point on this, this is what I do with children too. Because the hardest thing when coaching kids is not getting the buy-in of the parent. That's mm -hmm. really easy actually, because parents will always spend more money on their kids than they will on themselves. But it's getting the buy-in of the kid. That's the challenge. And the kid never wants to do the class. They never want to do the school thing. So it's always important to tie the incentive. 
So I always ask the kids something like, well, what's something that you like to do? They might say something like, oh, I like soccer. Then I have to respond with an incentive system. Like, what do you think is the difference in a soccer captain and a soccer team member? Mm-hmm. And they'll go like, huh, I don't know. Like, uh, maybe they kick the ball faster. I was like, no, they lead the team. So then uh, the question I asked that seven-year-old is, do you want to be the captain or do you want to be a member? And they'll, they always say captain, especially if they're, they're a boy. So I go, okay, so communication is how you become a captain. Do you want to be a soccer captain, join this thing? And they get the kid goes, yeah. So that's the key. It's all about going into WIF. IIFM radio, which is what's in it for me. Mm, yeah, definitely. And I find many people are afraid to be beginners. They don't want to start something because they know it's going to require work and is going to require them to put in some effort, right? If it requires effort, I don't want to be a part of it. Many people think that way because the brain is naturally lazy. The brain wants to have easy street, right? If you can give it to me, I'll take it. But if I have to work for it, uh, you know, that's a different story. So when we're, you know, when we are working with children or adults, they have to want it more so than just, okay, I would like to be a good public speaker, but I mean, I'm not really willing to put in the work or I'm not willing to invest in myself. And I always encourage people, invest in yourself, right? Because if you can be the person that believes in yourself, then you are going to be able to make so much more progress than people who are having trouble with that belief. Because you only need one person to believe in yourself. And if you're going on stage and you have an audience that supports you and you're not confident yet, use them, right? Use them as your energy. However, if you have an audience that you might not know their read, be confident in what you do. Understand what you do. You have already done the dialogue. You've already studied the PowerPoints where now you just have to go up and you have to show up. And I find people are not willing to show up. And I understand when they can be effective communicators, they can show up more easily than if I don't know how to communicate how I'm feeling or my stature. So I'm just going to hide in a corner and hope no one calls on me, or I'm a hide in a corner and hope no one addresses me, where that goes into now, all right, I am getting coaching, public speaking, I have better communication because I have invested in myself, but I still have this nagging fear of failure. The fear of failure is just something that's going to be there to help you understand that you're on the right path. I think people see a communication obstacle as I don't want this difficult conversation. Because if you don't have that difficult conversation, you're going to have a difficult life. I deal with this in a lot of my counseling when I'm working with marriages. They're afraid to have these difficult conversations. And I find that if you're able to find a voice inside yourself, then you're able to say, okay, I'm used to having this conversation with my spouse, with my partner. Then it goes into, well, we have to get used to that too. When I first started doing podcasts, yeah, I was a good public speaker. I was decent. I wasn't amazing or anything, but everything gets better, especially my blogs. This is all a building block. When I first started my blog in 2018, guess what? They were terrible. But if you look at where I am today, you know, four years later, That is night and day. And the same thing with my podcast. Episode one is different than episode 115. Mm. Just because I was willing to put myself out there. I was willing to be a learner. I was willing to be a beginner. And I was always a little bit camera shy. I don't want to be on camera. Don't put me on camera. All right. I'm not a superstar, just a regular guy. And it's not so much to diminish my value saying I'm a regular guy. I'm just a regular person, right? That just leads me to saying, when you do something enough, it becomes easy. First day of teaching is going to be the hardest day of teaching. What do you do? How do you teach, right? Yeah, you went to school, you did all the coursework, you have the degree to be a teacher, but do you know how to teach? And the answer is maybe, because you could have a knack for it, but you also could have to learn how that class is working too, how to teach. And I had to learn this the hard way. I had to be in the classroom to learn how to be effective teacher because yeah, 
you can be the best communicator, but if you don't understand your audience, that is key. Because if I have kindergartners, I'm not going to talk about, you know, Newton's theories. I'm going to talk about, well, you know, what's going on in your life and what's happening on the playground, right? It's a different conversation. And many people have the idea of, I want to talk about what I want to talk about, what's interesting to me, not you. I want to talk about what's interesting to me. I want to talk about my likes, my feelings, what makes me happy. So I wanted to ask as one of the final questions is, why are people so interested in making sure the conversation appeases them? Mm, That's a tough one, man. You can go in different directions there. But if I had to give my honest answer, to keep it simple, I'd say the reason is because there's a deep sense of insecurity within themselves, Mm. right? And what I mean by that is the reason why I mean you're very good. I mean, we're not the best. We're still working on ourselves, especially me. On, on creating space for others is because we got a lot to pour from. You know, if, if you're a really happy person, you want to be interested in helping other people because you've already been super successful. You've already done, well, but you know, there's more success to come obviously, but you know, you, you, you're grateful for what you have. And I think when you don't have that, when you don't have that support system where you can just talk about your feelings, talk about your emotions, even if it's just one person, you feel the need to use every conversation like a support system in some way, shape, or form. So that's where I think it stems from. And how do you how do you overcome that? I think one is to realize that coming to that awareness is the first step to change. And I still do this. I'm not perfect. There's definitely instances where I hog too much conversation. But I'd say the the other piece is practicing gratitude on a more regular basis, understanding what we have versus what we don't have. And that leads to a lot of a lot more happiness. And then the third piece is, is an exercise I got from one of my buddies that I think it pronounces it way better than I do called the bliss list. Make a list of things that just bring you joy. There can be very little things in life. For me, it's like, you know, listening to Justin Bieber dancing alone in my basement in between meetings because I'm always booked with so many calls and talking with people and having discussions. So just have dance meetings. And, and that's, those are those little things that accumulate joy and allow you to pour into other people. So that's what I would think about is to really ask ourselves the harder questions around life. Why do I feel the need to take up space in this moment versus giving that space to someone else? And once we have those honest conversations with ourselves and we find the honest answers that come with it, that's when we're able to, to create real transformation in the way we show up for others. Because I'm sure a lot of it isn't intentional once we realize it. Beautifully said. Can we tell people how they can find you, your YouTube channel? I'm sure people are raring to say, okay, I need to get some public speaking help because they want to have effective communication. So of course, tell them where they can find you, website, everything. Yeah, absolutely, brother. What a a joy to speak to you. Thanks for having me on. You have a very calm demeanor. Love yourself. I love it. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Very good. So so two two ways to stay in touch. The first one is definitely the YouTube channel. Just type master talk in one word and you'll have access to hundreds of free videos on how to communicate ideas effectively for free. And the second way to keep in touch, if for those who are interested in coaching specifically, you can come to one of my free trainings. I do a free training over Zoom every few weeks. And you can go to rockstarcommunicator.com to register for one of our upcoming trainings. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right. Any final words before we say our goodbyes? Yeah, I would say the only final word is the question I mentioned earlier. Don't forget it. How would your life change if you were an exceptional communicator? That question is a lot more powerful than people might think. But it'll only be powerful if at the end of this episode, which all of you have made it to, so congratulations on that, is what are you going to do when you finish this episode? Are you going to take that question and throw in the dustbin like most people? You're actually going to take 15 minutes, not 15 hours, not 15 years, not 15 months, 15 minutes out of your life to just reflect on that question for yourself. Huh, how would my life be different if I was a great community? I never really thought about that. And if you start thinking about that, you'll find the motivation to keep going. Whether that's watching YouTube videos, coming to trainings, doing whatever you need to do to succeed, but you'll find a way. Mm -hmm. Definitely. All right, everyone, Brendan Kumarasan. All right, I'd like to thank my guest, Brendan Kumarasamy, for coming on and talking about communication. He is a communications coach and he helps people with being more pronounced in their words and then being able to say what they want to say, even though it might be shied upon, right? 
we don't have a fear of public speaking per se. It's just that we don't have enough experience with it yet. So if you're looking to build experience, head over to his YouTube channel. And of course, like, comment, subscribe to both our channels and to help build the community and to share our content with the world so other people can learn how to be proficient in speaking, where we can bring back cordial conversations and not have to worry so much about what other people think. My name is Michael Reardon. I'm a mindset coach. If you have any questions, email me coaching in session at gmail.com. I will see everyone on the next episode of Coaching in Session. Until then, everyone take care.